Hi, I'm Jamie. This is Dead Dodge Garage, and this is a 1969 Plymouth GTX 440 with a little problem. Let's get in there and figure out what that is. Well, that is a problem. Hey, should the bolts be like tight or something? Smash it with a hammer. The other week I did a video on this 1969 Plymouth GTX which a lot of you folks seem to really like, so it warranted a follow-up. You'll notice it's now up on the lift and kind of sort of in pieces. Well, there's good reason for that. You may recall a scene from the first video when I hit the brakes on this thing pretty hard and the oil light came on. Well, I probably should have paid more attention to that. Yesterday I did the front end alignment on this thing. It needed it really, really badly. After I finished that, I took it out for a test run. A half a mile down the road, I hit the brakes to turn around in a parking lot. And when I did that, the oil light came on and stayed on for like 10 or 15 seconds. So that was not good. It might have allegedly started making a little bit of tappet noise before the pressure finally came back. Not to the point that I'm worried about it, but to the point that we need to figure out what's wrong here. This engine was rebuilt by a gentleman who's no longer winning with us. It really had no miles on it before it got to here. Now we checked the oil I and mean, we're not complete idiots. And it was low, and it was like here. Okay, so quart, quart and a half. But that is a seven quart oil pan. It was used on six packs and I think late HP motors. Hemi's got a similar deep pan as well. Now we wanted to get in here anyway because there was no windage tray. We're gonna install one of these fancy Moroso windage tray seal assemblies. Nice, quick, easy. We'll save hours doing this instead of cleaning up an original steel one. I had a theory because again, while it was slightly low on oil, it wasn't that low on oil. And yet, on hard braking, the oil was sloshing away from the pickup, the pickup was pulling in air, and the oil light was coming on. My theory was that the pickup was not at the bottom of the pan. Yeah, I was right. Let's introduce some science. Note, this pickup is right around four inches. Look where four inches sits on this pan. Yeah, not the bottom. If the pan was underfilled, Sloshing oil under braking would have run right away from that pickup. That's bad. For exactly this reason, you need your oil pickup as far down in the pan as it possibly can be. It can't be ramming into the bottom of the pan. That would prevent it from sealing. Usually what I do is leave the cork gasket out, make the pickup touch the pan, you know, through bending and turning and what have you. And then when you put the gasket in, you get your little bit of gap so they don't touch. So here's the important lesson. This car is not supposed to have a seven quart pan. This should have a five quart pan. The factory pan number is 402. You'll see that number on it. This pickup appears to match one of those. The deep pan is a fine upgrade for more capacity, but you need to have the pickup that matches it. Otherwise, as we've learned here, you're totally shooting yourself in the foot. Also, there's another thing too. Cars that were equipped with a deep pan from the factory have an extra guard here. That's because the deep pan actually sticks below the factory K-member. Here's a look at that piece on an original six pack car. Note how much farther down that sticks. That's so if you're gonna bottom out on anything, it'll bottom out on that and not tear your deep pan to pieces. Now you can see this pickup is turned up somewhat. It might actually be bent. I may be able to maneuver this thing to the point of working with the deep pan, but I'm just not sure I can make up an inch. We do have a spare Mopar Performance pickup here. It appears to be roughly the same, but it might be less bent. We're pretty sure by the number this is also for a 402 pan, but we may be able to make that one work more easily. A better move might be to just install the correct oil pan, but well, we might be able to dig one out, but then we have to restore that. And then you are losing that extra capacity, but it's also safer. I guess the real lesson here is if you're putting a combination like this together, you really need to think about all of these things. We actually drained and measured the oil from this pan, right about three and a half quarts. That is not enough. Also note this pan has baffles. That one is bent, and it was really hard to get the pan down around the pickup. If you've never dropped one of these pans in the car, it's really not the worst thing in the universe. You have to drop the steering cross link out of the way, which means unhooking the pitman arm and the idler arm, popping the joints out there. Then that simply drops down. The bolts up here at the front are above the K-frame, so they're a huge pain in the butt to reach, but other than that, it's really straightforward. In this case, again, the baffle was running into the pickup and we had to remove the transmission guard to wedge the pan into, then we were able to kind of drop it down and do the removal dance. Not all, but many of life's problems can be solved with bending. 
So I gave that a shot. I grabbed the pickup and just like ripped down on it. And now, as you can see, we're at right about four and five eighths. It's closer, but it's still half an inch off. I may be able to bend it more, but by the time it gets down to here, it's also gonna be at an angle. And the actual pickup opening really isn't gonna be a whole lot lower, if that makes sense. Also, any lower and the dipstick's gonna run into it. It just barely clears now. Here's that spare one mocked up in a seven quart pan that's sitting on the ground here. You know, that kind of looks right, doesn't it? I haven't measured the extension of the dingus end there up into the block. It goes a ways. <sighs> it sure looks close. I think I'm gonna swap to this one. Of course, when I said I was gonna do that, I'm gonna let Evan do that. He's less of a coward than I am. That thing was not loose in the block, I'll tell you that. These two are almost identical, but there is a height difference and it looks like it's just about the half inch that I need. So we'll pop that one in the block. All right, we're just about at five now. I think we can live with that. The fact that you can actually see it sticking below the K-frame, yeah, that kind of tells me everything I need to know. I wouldn't say it's perfectly level, but it's really, really close. Now here's the thing. This is not a Mopar exclusive problem. Yeah. A non-Mopar nut might not know that there are two different pans and different pickups and things, but anytime you're assembling an engine, you need to verify the pickup to pan clearance. Otherwise, you can have problems exactly like we did here, or worse. I measured five and one eighths inch from the top of the Moroso gasket to the bottom of the pan. So five appeared to be like right about here. So we should have something like an eighth to a quarter of a gap. That's pretty good. Now, if you do know Muscle Era Mopars really well, you probably know this already, but in case you don't, I'll give you a quick visual identification guide. There's your standard 402 number B-body big block pan. That was found on all kinds of B-bodies in the Muscle Era. This is a seven quart pan. Note that sump is actually longer and it's deeper. The shape in general is a lot different. And while this does have a special number, it's not printed, embossed, stamped, whatever into the pan like on others. There's a rough eyeball on the depth difference. It doesn't look like much, but it kind of is, especially again, when the seven quart drags on the ground below your K-frame. Once again, Evan's doing all the hard work. We're pretty sure this is a brand new reproduction pan. Evan's got the pan nice and clean and even bet the baffle back into place. Very nice. You ever walk like all the way across the shop for something and then completely forget what that something is? Well, that's where I'm at right now. Ooh, look. This is that head gasket I destroyed on the way back from Illinois in that charger. Good times. Yay. Oh yeah, don't worry about that. We're gonna do valve covers and gaskets on this sometime in the near future. Oh, don't worry about this either. I don't wanna talk about this. You know, there is a torque spec for these bolts like all other bolts, but I never ever use it. It's 12 foot pounds. If you try to take these to 12 foot pounds, you're gonna destroy like gaskets and bend pans and do all kinds of stuff. I just snug them by hand, ideally with a small handle. It's actually 15 foot pounds. Yeah, I would never tighten those to 15 foot pounds. Do it by hand, carefully, several times, and double check them later. Especially if you've got a cork gasket, these bolts tend to work their way loose. All back together and ready to do stuff. Here's a view in the plug hole where the pickup ended up. You can see that pinch weld there, it extends below that. Now well, at least a quarter of an inch. Anyway, it's good to me. This kind of backs up Evan's theory on what happened here. This is a big five quart jug poured straight into the sump and it reads perfectly full. But that's before filling the filter and other things in the engine. This is an aftermarket stick as well. It looked like the mark was about accurate, but maybe it's not. All right, it moved slightly. It was basically right at the ad line when I pulled it out. That's after firing the thing up and allowing it to fill the filter and the pickup and what have you. So, proper fill on this thing with the shorter filter we had to put on it is probably at like the top of the word full. Because aftermarket parts, as you may be aware, they always fit perfectly. We've got about six and a half quarts in. Again, it's normally seven quarts, but we've got a short filter. Here's where the line ended up. Yeah. It's like right above the letters by a bit. See, I put another mark on there. That is because I had the stick in backwards. I guess it's backwards. It was running into the manifold. And there's a rubber grommet at the top, which was not locked in all the way. So forget that mark. 
That's the important one. It's more than a little off. If you go by that original mark, massively low looks full. And if you put five quarts in it and it reads full, you might be inclined to think that's right. And then with the wrong pickup in there that's an inch off the bottom of the pan, that is a recipe for disaster. That is a great way to blow up your brand new engine. I'm not saying I'm like a brilliant super genius or anything, but I have put together a lot of engines and I always check the pickup fit. At least make sure it's close. Now, obviously this is a customer car. So I definitely didn't test maximum acceleration. If I did, I would have run into this exact same problem, only the results probably would have been much worse. In the first video, I pointed out that this air cleaner was hitting the wiper motor. That's because this is a correct 69 air cleaner, but the engine has 70 valve covers. So they had flipped this breather around so the hose could run over to the other side where the 70 breather is. Because of that, this ran into the wiper motor. I've since flipped it around the correct way and now it clears. We're gonna solve everything wrong with the top end of this engine using a set of these reproduction valve covers. I have to say they're decent quality parts, but not amazing quality parts. Anyway, that's a project for another day. For now, let's make sure this thing isn't gonna blow up. 69 GTX, 70 Roadrunner. That's cool. 69 Air Grabber, 70 Air Grabber, which is arguably much cooler. Also slightly broken on this car right now. I actually did this same comparison a long time ago with that white 68 Roadrunner, but anyway, 68 and nine lines, 70, no lines and a scoop. Both cool, but I prefer this one. Well, the oil's staying in it so far, so that's good news. Let's go drive this thing. Now again, this is not my car and it's a new engine. So we won't be testing it thoroughly. Also, it's almost out of gas, but that's fine. That gas smells terrible. But we gotta see what's what here. Oh yeah, a lot of commenters on the first video were admiring the speedometer. This thing only goes a max speed of 15 miles an hour. Yeah, you're gonna be holding traffic up like that. Anyway, it drives pretty well. The wheel is close. It might be a hair left, which is funny because it was a hair right before. There, slammed on the brakes and the oil light stayed off. So I'm gonna say it's probably fixed. All right, you can have a little acceleration for a treat. some corners, do a couple more braking tests, make sure the front end feels good, and make sure the oil light stays off. And then I'm gonna declare victory on this operation. But of course, there's still more to do. The aforementioned valve covers. We're waiting on a rebuilt wiper motor to show up. Turns out it had the wrong wiper motor in it. That was the whole issue there. Oh yeah, admire the Detroit locker or lunchbox style rear end. It makes annoying clicking noises because race car. Yeah, this is cool. Sounds good. Yeah, the wheel's pretty good. I really don't think I could get it any better than that. There is an art to centering steering wheels. And I am an artist, but not that kind. Hey, I must have done something right because it's no longer terrifying. It goes straight down the road and it feels confident, competent, decent. It's nice. I think it's good, is what I'm trying to say. Brake test? Yeah, we still have oil pressure. <laughs> there you go. What's a little burning smell among friends? Yeah, we have got to get the cover thing fixed. Obviously our brand new oil is now slowly leaking out of the engine, but that's okay. Well, it's not okay, but you know what I mean. I have been doing the same exact test drive with every single car for two years. And that is in no way depressing. Usually I'm over there, but there's a car in the way right now. It's just so green. The tag says G5. That sure looks darker than G5 to me. A lot of other people seem to agree too. It's definitely not as dark as G8. This is G8. I mean, you can see the difference. I think it's just a shading thing. The color is a little bit off, but eh. I was truly amazed by the number of commenters that liked the green. I am not a green guy. It's cool, don't get me wrong. I think it's a neat car, but green? 
I did point out the air grabber system in the previous video, but I want to bring a little bit more attention to that because the commenter did not quite grasp how it works. There are vents right here that draw air in that way toward that fancy oval air cleaner. And when those are open, there's another vent up here that shuts off engine compartment air. It's a neat system. I sincerely doubt it does much, but it is neat. Uncle Tony did a great video on scoops and Chrysler's factory air scoops quite some time back. I think it's called the scoop on scoops. Anyway, in that video, he pretty much explains how all of Chrysler's factory air intake systems on the hoods are like worthless. This thing is sweet. The GTX is something special. I think I have a bit more love for the stripper all business Roadrunner, but the GTX is good. Just make mine like blue or dark red, please. I know I'm close on my timing settings because it starts like this. Oh yeah. After my test drive in this thing yesterday, I was legitimately worried about the engine's health. Thankfully, there were no giant chunks in there. And I did look at the cam and lifters. They're in great shape. Thankfully, here at Rocket Restorations, we're all hoarders and we keep parts to fix things like this right on the shelf, so. One day from, hey, this thing has no oil pressure when you hit the brakes to completely fixed. I'm pleased with that. If you're looking to put disc brakes on your classic Mopar and you're looking at expensive stuff like Will Woods or whatever, I wanna remind you, this car has a factory 70s Chrysler disc brake system on the front and factory brakes on the rear. And it's just got one of those add-on generic booster master systems. And they work. All right, there's a little premature lockup in the rear when you really try them, but yeah, the point is, factory disc brakes are pretty darn good. You don't need to spend a ton of money on anything else. This is a perfect test case for why you either want to drop the pressure to your rear drum brakes or replace them with like smaller ones when you do the discs. Because having those 11s back there, they will lock up. And locked up rear brakes is not what you want. That's how you end up almost sliding into parked cars in your 1970 Dart Swinger. Or whatever. It looks even darker on camera than in person. Maybe it's the contrast with the grass. Anyway, whatever. It's green. There's a lot of love for this car on the channel, so I didn't figure anyone would mind a follow-up video. It's a great lesson, if nothing else. Rebuilding a 440 isn't the most expensive thing in the world, but it's definitely not something you want to do, like, for fun, you know, blowing up your brand new engine. So just try to keep that in mind. As mentioned, there are more projects coming on this thing, so you may well just see it again. Until then, as ever, thank you very much for watching. And remember, God loves a working man. Don't trust aftermarket parts. See a doctor to get rid of it. Wouldn't it be see a mechanic? Come on, man, it was right there. Ugh, smells like oil.